Hi, uh, I'm Matt. I uh, founded a Bitcoin company in 2014, been doing this for a little bit, uh, got into Ethereum uh, early 2017. And I wanted to talk to you about a project called TBTC, where we're bridging Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, it, we're doing this in collaboration with uh, what we're calling the cross-chain group, James Presswich, Suma, um, and a couple other folks. So why are we all here? Um, I know some of us came for the unstoppable code. Uh, some of us came for the world computer. But the latest meme is DeFi. Um, so DeFi is around a half billion dollar market, give or take the last month's market gyrations. Um, and there's this like, I think we're excited. There's a new, there's a new narrative. Um, but I guess my question is, is, is DeFi growing? And is DeFi as exciting as we think? Because when you look at half a billion dollars and you compare it to, again, these are old numbers, the $24 billion market cap for Ether, um, you start to realize maybe we're actually going to hit a ceiling soon. Um, and so when you look at projects like Maker, you look at other, other projects that are limited by collateral, we're all kind of thinking, how, how can we get access to more value on this chain uh, to do more DeFi? So some people are interested in security tokens or real estate. I'm not. Uh, I'm interested in trustless assets. So for me, the next obvious pool of collateral is Bitcoin, which is a little bit bigger than, than the other two. So uh, one way to frame this discussion is how can we bring DeFi to Bitcoin? Um, that's a little paternalistic. I think a lot of Bitcoiners who may or may not be watching this would be like, Bitcoin doesn't need DeFi. But another way to look at it is, you know, Bitcoin was, was the first DeFi, be your own bank. Now we have cash. How can we get loans? So I actually uh, went to buy a house recently. And uh, I knew, OK, my, most of my life's work is crypto. This is going to be an interesting experience. And so I started looking for what lender could help me out uh, and, and keep me from having to sell my crypto. So I finally found someone. I got really excited. Uh, and so I, I talked to this mortgage provider, and they were like, oh, yeah, we're totally crypto friendly. We're so glad that you came to us. Uh, and so I said, cool, what do I do? And they said, sell your crypto. Just sell it and come back in 30 days. We'll pretend like we didn't have this conversation, and then you can buy a house. Uh, no. <laughs> so, well, you know, one way is how can we bring, one way to look at this is how do we decentralize finance with Bitcoin? Another is how can we make Bitcoin available everywhere? Um, so Ethereum has this opportunity to be an interop hub and to bring assets onto the chain to work with DeFi today. How can we make Bitcoin one of those assets? Um, but you know, for the engineers in the room, also just like when sidechains. So we've been talking about sidechains and interop since at least 2014, probably earlier. And so far, they've been, for the most part, vaporware. Uh, a bunch of L1s right now are working on bringing out something new. But it would just be really intellectually satisfying to see um, a side chain between Bitcoin and Ethereum today. So people have been trying to solve this problem, uh, mostly through hacks. So the first big hack that people have used are federations. Um, if you guys are familiar with WBTC in the Ethereum space, uh, Liquid in the Bitcoin space, um, and the basic idea behind a federation uh, is that you have a bunch of uh, folks that come together, you trust them, uh, they hold your Bitcoin, and then you know they'll they'll validate uh, somewhere else. So what's great about federations? You get your price exposure that uh, DeFi is so interested in, and you have a super simple implementation. Okay. So anyone in this room, I imagine, uh, who has touched Solidity before could create something similar to WBTC today, um, which is great. So why are we here? So the reason that I joined crypto uh, was to own my own money. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw Taylor's talk from my crypto the other day, uh, but it was a little bit about back to basics. Why are we all here? Uh, we're here for individual ownership, consent, and sovereignty. And the second you take a peg, a federation-based peg that's, uh, that's trustful, you've lost that. So you've lost seizure resistance. You've lost, um, you've lost any sort of like trustlessness of the system. So the other big approach that people are using to get price exposure on Ethereum are synthetics. Um, basic idea, you guys are probably familiar, is we lock up a bunch of ETH, and then there's some sort of algorithm that does something with it so that you peg a price to an external asset. So synthetics are great. They're censorship resistant. Uh, so, if, for example, if you have like something that's pegged to a stock on Ethereum, you can be confident that that's not going to be seized from you. You get your price exposure. And, of course, there are downsides. Um, 
So there, there are two that I see. So one is, uh, is just that it's, it's dangerous. Uh, the more synthetics you stack, the more uh, FX risk you stack, and the more of a chance of like a black swan event happening through all of our DeFi systems. So if I asked you guys how much ETH would you be willing to lock up to be confident that that amount was going to be more than one Bitcoin in six months, uh, I think we would all have different opinions on, on what that is. It's, it's a difficult problem. Um, and then the other thing with synthetics is you can't redeem them for Bitcoin. So if I'm trying to convince my, uh, my Bitcoin friends from, from the earlier, earlier uh, 2010s uh, to use a system like this, they're not interested in ETH-backed synthetics. They want to know that they're using Bitcoin on Ethereum. So what's my desire? What do I really want uh, that I'm not getting from these two systems? I'd like a censorship-resistant, fully Bitcoin-backed ERC-20 token. So no trust, no KYC, confident that any attacker is going to lose money and that you can always get back to your Bitcoin. How? Um, so before I dive into the sidechain mechanism, I'm actually going to give you guys uh, a super quick demo of what we got so far, just to kind of like make it concrete. Um, the way that we've piled up these videos, we'll see how it goes. So this is TBTC. Um, it's a pretty straightforward DAP experience. It's actually a cross Ethereum and Bitcoin DAP. Um, you open up a deposit here. Uh, you, you fetch a BTC address. So you actually get someone off chain to give you a public key hatch. And then you pay one BTC. You can use any wallet. Uh, in this example, we use green wallet. Um, it's, I guess, not any wallet. It is SegWit. Uh, we would rather not stick with legacy BTC. Um, and once this confirms, I'm pretty sure I, I... There we go. Good. You don't have to wait on the full 10-minute uh, confirmation for this particular video. Uh, you submit an SPV proof to the Ethereum chain showing that you made a Bitcoin deposit and that it's actually safe for, uh, for us to mint TBTC on the Ethereum side. Voila. Uh, so what's the idea behind that? Um, we're calling it a bonded multi-federated peg, which is a whole bunch of words relative to a pretty simple demo. Um, the idea is that uh, side chains have talked about this two-way peg uh, for years. There are a lot of problems with federations that I've already talked about, so how can we fix them? Uh, one, you can actually watch the Bitcoin chain. Two, you should not trust entire economies to 11 of 15 multi-sigs. And three, if you're going to have to trust someone, Get them to put down a deposit first. So going into that in a little bit more detail. In TBTC, every Bitcoin that is deposited has a new dynamic federation that's been created. So we actually have our own random beacon that we've built on Ethereum. Uh, and that is then going to sample validators. And they're going to come together and they're going to create a new wallet. Two, bond all of the federation members. Obviously, you guys know what we're going to do with the bond. Um, but the basic idea is make sure everyone has skin in the game before you accept them as a validator. Read Bitcoin history. So again, if you're familiar with Solidity, obviously we're not really reading Bitcoin history. What I mean is someone off chain is providing SPV proofs from the Bitcoin chain to Ethereum. And then finally, what are we going to do with that bond? So if someone misbehaves, we slash. But typically, when you're talking about slashing at the consensus level, uh, you just want to like burn it to the ground, right? You don't want that token to exist anymore, and you want the person who misbehaved to, to feel it. Um, but here, slashing is not just punitive. We actually use the funds that are slashed to make sure that, uh, that the peg is whole. So if someone does misbehave in a system like this, uh, not only do we take their money, we take their money, we use that to buy back TBTC and maintain the supply peg. So, uh, I don't have a slide for this, going off script a little bit, um, but what do we need here? We, we obviously, we need a price feed. Um, so originally, the, the V1 spec of TBTC just has a centralized price feed. It's even simpler than Maker's, uh, Maker's V1 medianizer, right? Um, and I put that out, and I knew I felt bad as a system designer. We were all unhappy, but you know we wanted to get to mainnet faster. Uh, but it was a lightning rod for uh, Bitcoin depositors. They just could not stand the idea of a centralized price feed. Um, so since then, I don't know if you guys were around uh, a couple days ago on floor six. We've actually been whiteboarding a decentralized uh, price feed alternative. We're calling it feedless feeds. Um, so interested, uh, excited, really, to share a little bit more with you guys about that. Um, but I'm not going to go too far into it now. So. 
Uh, the other question that this brings forward is collateral. Uh, so there's a, uh, a 2.5x collateral requirement for this, naively. I say 2.5 because I wanted to be honest and choose the big number, but if you think about it, it's really more like 1.5x collateral because there's liquidity on the Ethereum side. Um, but actually, through some cleverness and by allowing the Bitcoin depositors to collateralize against each other, you can get it down closer to 1.4 uh, total collateral. Um, so some takeaways from this. Uh, it is expensive to run. It's more expensive than getting goxed, or sorry, less expensive than getting goxed. Goxed is very expensive. Um, and it should be good for ETH as well. We are still locking up ETH, uh, and we do fall back to a synthetic in the case of misbehavior. Uh, so, you know, it's DevCon. There are devs here. Um, I want to invite you guys to check out tbtc.network. Uh, if you are interested in building dApps on Bitcoin, uh, if you're interested in using Bitcoin as collateral in your DeFi project, please come talk to me, um, talk to James Pressbridge or one of these other guys who are, who are all kind of involved with this project. Um, it's going to be sweet. And uh, thanks a lot. My name is Matt Luongo. Uh, you can follow up a little bit more with the cross-chain group as well. Um, so we've got three minutes, guys. If anyone has any questions around TBTC, I'm happy to give you guys some more details. Okay, guys. Um, well, that's everything I've got. So thanks a lot. Looking forward to talking to you after.